So now uh, we have a joint session by Holly Putnam and Anne Enright talking about capacity for care. Thank you very much. All right. Oh, you know what? I think our presentations got switched. This looks like it's Dr. Enright's up. Um, I don't know if we can switch it out. <laughs> Oh, okay. I have it on my thumb drive if you need it. Yep, okay. Does anyone? Does while they wait? <laughs> oh, you. <laughs> Do you want to chuck one in? Just roll it up and chuck it away. Okay. I'm sure I want to go. <laughs> All right. They are quite. Holly's going to throw some ducks. Just waiting for the IT, so it's always good to chuck a duck just, you know, <laughs> while you're waiting. Feel free to chuck a couple okay. more. It's very therapeutic. Okay. All right. Oh, 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 I'm so sorry. Oh. <laughs> I'm really sorry. This is never okay. going to make I'm trying for way in the back there. <laughs> you do have to duck when we're chucking a duck, by the way. So. I can wing it if I have to. Um, the, feel right. I'll give people something else to look at besides me. <laughs> did you see it? And this is my, no, yeah. The um, it's not there. Okay. If it's not there. I guess it's not there. Okay, I'm just going to, I guess I'll just try to wing it. I don't know. I'm sorry. I thought I had it on my uh, thumb drive, but that's okay. So I'll just, um, unfortunately, you guys are just going to be stuck looking at me instead of some slides the whole time. But what I wanted to start our presentation off is just the basic concepts of capacity for care. So this is something that we've been talking about back in the United States for several years now, and I'm hoping you guys are talking about this too. But in case it's a new concept for you, um, we'll just go over the various parts of that. So um, the idea behind capacity for care is that you're able to provide uh, care within um, and, and staffing for all of the animals that come into your facility within a reasonable time frame, within your budget, and um, making sure that it's done in a humane way. And that should be for any animal that comes in, regardless of their age or where they're originating from. And so uh, we all try to do you know, the best we can, and I'm sure we're all in this field for various reasons, but I would bet that we all share, one of the reasons we share is that we all want to make the lives of animals better that come into our facilities. And we probably want to do that for as many animals as possible, and that's where we can get into trouble because it's very hard to say, okay, you know, what, wh how many animals can come in, and when do we stop doing that? When do we say, okay, no more? And so this presentation is going to hopefully give you guys some guidelines as to help to help you make um, a more formal set of uh, guidelines to operate at home. 
so capacity, oh, there we go. Okay, I see it now. <laughs> I'll let myself get caught up here. And All right, I'm just gonna fast forward to where I was, okay. All right, we talked about that. Okay, so here in Australia, the research I found, I hope this is accurate, is that hundreds of thousands of animals are coming into your facilities on an annual basis. And it appears that your reported euthanasia rates are ranging from about 30 to 90%. And that, um, in the US, we have actually millions of animals that are coming into our facilities with a, a similar euthanasia range. I mean, some uh, shelters have gotten their euthanasia rates down significantly, but some shelters are still up near 90%. So that's something, you know, that uh, pertains to, I, I would guess, the entire world. So again, sometimes we think, we think we're doing really good with uh, what we're doing by bringing, you know, letting animals come into our facilities, and it turns out that we're actually not. So things, the more animals that we let into our facility, the more chances that they're gonna be exposed, well, they might be bringing in infectious diseases, but they also will be exposed to infectious diseases. So similarly, you know, to anybody, like a room like this, if we just had 10 people in the room and one of the people were sick, the chances of us getting sick is probably slim if we're all spread out. But now that there's a few hundred of us in the room, the chances that somebody could be sick, and I'm, this is all hypothetical, hopefully nobody's sick and spreading diseases, but there could be more, more of us who are sick in this room, and because we're all in uh, closer quarters, we may potentially have a greater risk of contracting whatever virus is going around. And the quality of life is something that's extremely important to think about when you start thinking about how many animals that you're gonna be housing and taking care of in your facility. And I'll use this room as an example again. We're at a nice capacity right now for an event like this with all the animals, or sorry, with all of us in here. If we were to suddenly say, okay, we're gonna take the same number of people in this room, and now we have to use this as an emergency shelter, so we're gonna spend the night in this room, and maybe we even have to bring like our family members with us. We might be able to tolerate that for a short period of time, but if then I said to you, um, well, your length of stay for this uh, room with your family living in here is now gonna be three months, you may suddenly be like, oh, no way. You know, you might not be able to tolerate that. So we think we need to think about our animal shelters in the exact same uh, manner. We also need to think about how many, uh, how much staff is needed to take care of these animals and how long that will take each uh, person to perform those, uh, those duties. How much money it's gonna cost us to take care of all of these animals as well. And then also, I think equally important is the community perception of how many animals are we are putting into our facilities. So you may be aware, I hope you're not one of those organizations, but there's definitely uh, facilities back home where people in the community, so nobody that has anything to do with animal welfare will be like, well, I'm not gonna go to that shelter because I went in there once and they had dog crates stacked on top of each other and there was urine all over the place and it appeared that nobody had fed the animals you know, that morning. So we definitely don't want to do that because we would lose community support and end up with a bad reputation in our, in our communities. So we want to start with the very basic minimum concepts and we back home look, at, look to the five freedoms for this and if you're not familiar with this, these were five freedoms that were developed by the UK Farm Animal Council back in 1965 to help improve the welfare of farm animals. And the, the, it is the freedom from hunger and thirst, freedom from discomfort, freedom from pain and injury, freedom from fear and distress, and freedom to express normal behavior. So when we're talking about capacity for care, we want to be able to provide at least those five freedoms. And I already told you the definition of capacity for care. This came from the uh, University of California at Davis's program, veterinary program. But I just wanna reiterate this, the second sentence to me is even more powerful than the first and it says, every sheltering organization must acknowledge their capacity for care and function within it to allow them to um, be the best resource for the animals and people in their community. So factors to consider when we're talking about capacity for care, it's multifactorial. It's not gonna be just one thing that you look at. We're gonna to need to look at our housing units and the size of those units, the number of staff we have, the money that we have available within our budget to dedicate to animal care and staffing, um, our average length of stay, 
and the ability to treat or manage uh, diseases that come in with these animals. With our housing units, we don't want to just count every single housing unit that we have in our shelter. We want to make sure it's in good working order and that it's a humane housing unit. So if you're in an older facility, there could be a chance that you might have a housing unit where the door doesn't latch properly or it's something that could cause injury to the animal. That's not one that you want to take into consideration when you're counting your housing unit. We also want to make sure we're looking at just dedicated animal spaces. So if your facility is the type that has, um, or, or uh, yes, that has animals like in offices or bathrooms or closets, um, those are not considered animal housing units unless you truly want to dedicate that space permanently to an animal housing unit and convert it to that. So, that, so you need to differentiate between the two. And housing units can also include foster animals, or sorry, foster homes as well. I wanted to show you this study that was done by the University of California's veterinary school as well. And this shows the stress score, which are the lines uh, that are going across the graph, as well as euthanasia rates for uh, which are the bars that are going up. And the two different colors represent cage size for cats. So the light blue color is for cats that were put in small cages in the shelter. Those would be two by two. And then the purple lines show uh, cats that were put in larger cages, so two by four. And you can see that if they were in a smaller cage, their stress score was higher and their euthanasia rate was higher as well. So really factoring in humane housing is, is extremely important. Go back to that. Okay. So our available housing units, the way you can do this, the most easy and basic way, is to look at how many, look at your data from last year. So on a monthly basis, how many animals came in, um, how many days of the month are in that particular month, and then divide that, divide the two. So that tells you, for instance, if we look at the top one, January 14th, they had 82 animals come in. There's 31 days in January, so they need at least three housing units for the month of January. And this is so plan for planning purposes for the upcoming year. Keep in mind, this can be a difficult, this, this may not be the most accurate way to do it because things can change throughout the year. You may have had, you know, a super cold January and just didn't have a high, as high of an intake as you would the following January. But in general, you can get an idea of how many housing units you're gonna need on a monthly basis by doing that simple calculation. For staffing, you're also going to need to take into account how many staff members and how long does it take to perform each task throughout the shelter. And you want you can break this down by minutes. So an example is if we're looking at intake, and it say it takes 10 minutes to do an intake for each animal, and say you have um, an average of 10 animals that are that go through intake at each day. You're going to multiply 10 minutes by 10 animals. That gives you 100 minutes. And in this example, it takes two staff members to do that. So then you multiply by two, and that's 200 minutes of staff hours. And so then you would just look at your at whatever length of day you guys have. If you have an eight hour day, a 10 hour day, convert that into minutes, and you would see that it would take about three hours to do, um, to do intake for this particular example. When we're looking at financial costs, you need to think about staff time that goes into that food for the animals, preventive and medical care that you're, um, that you're providing, behavioral modification, that's extremely important. We all know behavior, behavioral health is just as important as physical health, so that's something you don't want to skimp on. And any programs that you're doing or other ancillary procedures such as spay-neuter surgery or any other type of uh, surgeries um, and medical care that you're doing. And then average length of stay. So this is something that we need to pay attention to as well. This is the average number of days that animals stay in shelters. And we want to reduce this as much as possible because the shorter the average length of stay, the healthier it is for the animal and the shelter overall. So that means if they stay less uh, time in the shelter, they get out of there even quicker, they're less likely to be exposed to diseases. We all know that cats in particular, the longer they stay, the more likely they are to recrudesce herpes 
herpes virus if they have that already or they're more likely to become exposed to herpes virus or any other type of virus in the shelter. That would be true for dogs too. And I don't know if you guys uh, experience this here, but well, you probably don't because it sounds like pit bulls are illegal um, in Australia. But back home, that particular breed, we find that they tend to do okay for about a month in the shelter. They're the least likely to get adopted on average. But after that month, they tend to spiral downward behaviorally. So we are all trying to get those dogs out the door as quickly as possible. Um, the less they stay in the shelter, the less it's going to cost the shelter to provide for them. And then um, as soon as we get them out, their housing unit is available. So then we have more housing uni units available more frequently. And then the last thing that I just wanted to uh, mention to you when you're thinking about um, your capacity for care, again, is quality of life. And so do, um, do any of you have Asilomar Accords that you created in your facility? I see people nodding their heads. That's fantastic. And if you don't, I would really encourage you to do that. Be and the reason this helps um, with capacity for care is because what it does is it you you have a list of all of your medical conditions and all of your behavioral conditions and you sit down as a shelter and decide what do you have the ability to provide for? So it, you, they broke it down into like, is it manageable? Is it treatable? Um, do you need to euthanize the animal or um, something on that order? And then so each one you give, you assign, I, yes, I, we can manage this condition at the shelter or we can treat this condition at the shelter or no, we can't. This one is um, gonna be a euthanizable condition. And so that helps everybody know right off the bat if um, a diabetic cat comes into your shelter and you do not have the capacity or ability to uh, treat that cat, you would, th th your intake staff would know that's a euthanizable condition and either they can reroute it to another facility that, or an organization that can handle that or help the owner potentially find treatment elsewhere or, you know, um, I suppose in worst case scenario, end up euthanizing that cat. But what this is intended for is to avoid cats like that coming into your facility and sitting there and not getting the treatment that they, um, that they need and end up suffering. Okay, so I'm gonna pass this over to Anne. Okay. And you're over there. I'm just gonna talk into it. Okay, I'll just stay with you. Sorry. Okay, hello everybody, I'm back again, sorry. Um, but this is my favorite talk. I really like talking about the things that we did at Cat Protection Society and the changes that we made. And we did it with no extra money, didn't require any extra money, you just needed to think backwards or just do things differently because if you do things the same way all the time, year after year, well, you're not going to achieve anything. Um, now, which way do we go? Where do I point this? Who do I point this at? Um, okay, this is just briefly a little bit about the society where I was. Um, not much exciting on there, really. I suppose the, the main thing which was an influence for us was that the facility that we were in was falling down, so they moved us into the car park and put us in shipping containers and portables and knocked and the other place fell down, and so they're now building a new facility next door. So and they've been doing that for three and a half years. So um, and Gavin can attest to that. And... Um, so it was, we were struggling with or constrained by the fact that we were in portable facilities and we only had 30 adoption pens available to push all the cats through. So that was just something I had to keep in the back of my mind. Um, essentially, capacity for care for me, what I think of when I think of capacity for care is population management. So it's knowing what I've got on site, like I said the other day. It's knowing how you move it through. It's knowing how you keep the length of stay down to as short as possible. It's making sure that you are treating every single animal that you have on site as an individual and that you are meeting their own individual needs. And we all know that they vary. You know, you've got little kittens, you've got old geriatric cats, you've got dogs that are having behavioural issues, but you can't lump them together. You have to actually put them in their groups and then you have to assess each little individual by itself. And that way you know that if you can't deal with it, you can move it on to someone else that can or you can give it the best possible opportunity that you can. Uh, what else have I got? What's that say down the bottom? Um, and I always think of a shelter as a five-star resort and that the animals are coming into my five-star resort and they're the guests. 
So think of yourself here in this hotel, right? This is the shelter and you're the guests. So if you don't have any milk in your fridge or if the light's not working or the air conditioning's not working, you complain. But the animals in your resort, they can't complain and you know the outcome of what happens when they get stressed, frustrated and they can't move to a place, oops, move to a place where they would prefer to be. So I've said, we've all said this, it's about knowing your capacity for care, your length of stay, and where I was at the time, it was just shocking. It was like months. Um, barriers to achieving your goals, data, you know, we talked about that, and how, how much is it costing? That's, that's the key. Work out how much it's costing because that will, I guarantee you, motivate you to make some change. When I went in there, and I only went in there for two weeks, three and a half years ago, and... Um, it was an old facility, like I said, but an, an old's okay. I mean, I don't mind working in old, old facilities. And what you see here, these are the cages that they had in place there, and what you see there is only a quarter of what we had. So those crappy old metal cages, and we still actually have them in, in the old part there. Um, they're not moving into the new facility. But if you can just remember Harry Potter, and, you know, if you think about Harry Potter and you've got the, all the pictures on the walls and all the things are moving in the pictures, you know, and all the faces and things, cause it's just a moving feast. That was what I saw in every single room that I went in. There was just wall-to-wall -wall cages of faces and there were mums and kittens and adults and things with three legs and all these sorts of things and they just were at you and they were sick, most of them, not all of them, most of them were sick. They had crappy eyes, snotty noses, they were sneezing and we even had a little bit of kitten diarrhoea just to add a little bit of flavour to it. Um, for those that were here on Wednesday, like when I went there, we had 226 cats on site, which was like way too many. Um, diarrhoea, meeting our capacity for care, like no. We were shocking. So it had to change. And this, I think, sadly, is sort of the case in a lot of places and a lot of shelters around the place. So you've got a big funnel, right, and you just keep bringing everything in and you're thinking that you have to help everything and everything has to come in. And it's just not... You just can't keep doing that because you just end up with the mess that we had. Um, and so we had to turn our funnel upside down and it was just a, a matter of fact. That was just all that we had to do. So... What we did, we assessed our capacity for care, that was shocking. We looked at our average length of stay, that was shocking, because it was like months, like I said, because everything was sick, so everything had to wait to get better, and then everything had to get more vaccines, and it just went on and on. And my very immediate barriers that I needed to deal with was illness and the adoption rate, which was also bad. So I used our adoption-driven capacity. Fo I focused on that because that was what I could deal with. And I worked out uh, that we could have 72 cats on site for us to be able to do a proper job for those animals. So I had 226, right? So I had to get down to 72. And it's like, oh, my God, here we go. How do we do that? So what I did was, first of all, I started to try and reduce the numbers on site. And so all the little healthy ones coming in, we just shunted them straight through. They were in and out. Surgery, microchip, vax on your bike and away they went. I looked at our um, length of stay. I created a one-way flow through the shelter, created open selections, so the ones coming in, you know, two-day stray hold, uh, two hold for the owner surrenders, eight-day stray hold. If they had any chance of moving out quickly, they got up there, they got their little bit of real estate and they had to sell themselves. And that got them moving through really quickly as well. Um, we were vaccinating cats coming in, there were surrenders. We're making sure that the people were vaccinating them before they came in. We, I often did that. I asked them to pay for the vaccine, so we make a bit of money out of it. And then I, re, I avoided the eight-day stray hold that we have in Victoria, which was... I just manipulated the system. Um, we ramped up our foster care thing and we improved our social media, which was also not very good. Uh, housing, like I said, we had these horrible, horrible condos, but we were fortunate enough... Uh, sorry, um, cages. We were fortunate enough, because we were moving into temporary facilities and then moving into a new facility, we started to actually um, invest in some better housing. So we went from that to that, and we put that in the adoption areas, and that helped actually to pull the, the disease back a little bit as well, because those metal cages are shocking. What else did we do? This is one of the best things that we did. We started this in Western Australia with Cat Haven, with Ros and Martine here, Snip and Chip Program. 
And that was what it was. And that was one of the best initiatives. Everybody sort of liked the, the, the term. Uh, we made it affordable. I even desect some things for free if I had to. Pay for the microchip. I'll just slide a car straight under the table. Nobody will know. You can just, you know, you can, they come in with five cats, you know, th four females and a male, and they're struggling to pay for um, the four females. I'll do the male for free. I couldn't give a rats. Or I'd do some sort of creative accounting. I would never, ever be able to work in private practice. I would never make any money. Um, started working closely with the rescue groups. Maneki Nika was one of the big ones that was helping us out. Um, <laughs> Tried to get up the working cat program. That didn't really work. I'll tell you quickly later. Another thing that worked really, really well from our perspective was to get council partnerships up and running. Um, and the, the ranger that we had, Jenny, she's just fantastic. Um, she got her council to do two lots of desexing programs a year. Started off just doing 30 cats a year. We divided it up between ourselves and another clinic. And then she was moved it on to twice a year, two lots of cats. So there was, uh, sorry, two lots of 30 cats. So that we were then doing 60 cats a year. Um, she also convinced people that, you know, the neighbours have moved out, left their cat. I've been feeding it for two years. It's not my cat, but it sleeps on the bed. She encouraged them to adopt that cat, so microchip it in their name. She'd pay for the lot. And that was what really helped us get on our way. And in the six years when they, she'd started up this program with Banyul, we went down from 1,006 stray impounded cats a year to 141 just financial year past. So if you want to do the numbers for the council people here, if you're paying, like, I don't know, 150 bucks a cat to take into the pound, which end of the spectrum would you like to be at? You save yourself enormous amounts of money. And then other councils came to us as well, and then they wanted to participate in this snip and chip program as well. And so then I just made it a bit more expensive, made, I charged them $140, and I'll desex your cat, microchip it and vaccinate it because I'm trying to keep Pan Luke out of the shelter as well. And so they were more than happy for that as well. And we're now working with other councils to try and implement that program. It's only on the private cats, not the stray cats. They have um, arrangements with other, other pounds. We're just working with the private cats. I've got enough to do. I, haven't, I can't do all of them. Um, managed admission. We're not that good at this sometimes. It works sometimes and sometimes not. We try to do surrender appointments, and when they work, it's fantastic, but sometimes the people just turn up with a box for me. Um, we need to improve on this, but it does help. We don't tell anybody we are not going to help your cat or, or help you and take your cat, but we will tell people, I can't do it today. Can you come back tomorrow or next week? And somebody wants to give me six cats. Okay, can you give me two now and two in a month? And, and they're happy to do that. As long as they know that there's an opportunity for them to be helped, they will participate. There will always be the people that need help immediately but and we accommodate that. Uh, the community clinic, that was just another win as well. We just got that up and running. Um, it didn't get hardly any advertising at all. It was just word of mouth. And as I said the other day, we just got swamped. I, I just couldn't keep up with all the people that were wanting to come in. Um, and the result was, we just in the summer, we would run out of cats and kittens you know, for adoption. We would just run out. And it was like, oh, what are we going to do now? We got like five cats up for adoption. And they're all the timid ones at the back. And so then we started to approach other people and we would go to Lost Dogs and Maneki Nico would help us by bringing down all the Mildura train cats and we would go to other councils that had pounds and they would transfer into us. We couldn't, tra we couldn't take a lot in one go because we only had the 30 adoption pens, but we would take 10. So two or three times a month we would be bringing in cats from other councils and other areas to help them, plus taking on our own, own council surrenders and so forth. And we would take surrenders from other councils as well. So it was like, you know, the more the merrier. It was sandy like. But we were just running out of cats. It was amazing. I didn't believe it at first. Now, what didn't work and what, what challenges did I have? Would I do something different? Yeah, maybe. The portable facilities, like I said, they didn't hinder, but they just restricted what we had to do. So I had to really keep an eye on what we had on site. So every day I would be out there counting cats to see just how many I've got in adoption, how many have I got that need surgery, how many have I got that's going to come in and how many can I bring in sort of thing. So I was always keeping, had to keep a finger on the pulse. Introducing change was very hard. Some people don't like change. Some of them had been there for a long time. Understanding that less is more. 
Some people did not get that. They still thought that we needed to take in everything and we could all help it. They did not understand that if you have one cat and you can get the length to stay down to a week, that that pen can help four cats in a month, as opposed to bringing in something else and sticking it in a pen and it doesn't move and it gets sick and it's there for two months. They didn't, they just, I don't know, they didn't, they didn't get it. Um, people that know me know that I don't, I don't like to hang around sort of thing. And I was mo I think in some instances I might have been moving too fast for some of the people at work and they were getting a bit, a bit flustered. That was probably my fault. But if, I, if we decide in the morning, oh, we're going to do this, I'd like it to be happening this afternoon, maybe tomorrow, you know, not in two months' time sort of thing. So that used to frustrate me a little bit as well. But we eventually got there. <laughs> We eventually, sometimes we agreed to disagree, but that's okay. And then there was the dead wood in the place. And, you know, every organisation's got it. And you look at people and you think, what are you doing? Why are you here? You know, I'd think that. I didn't ask them, but I did, actually, I did think it a lot. And I'm, I imagine, you know, every organisation must have one or two of those people. Anyway, eventually they sort of moved on. I, I don't think I was involved in that. But, in, <laughs> but you know, You've always got the ball and chain that just stops you making that 100 metre sprint like, like I do that. Now, what we didn't do well was the working cat program, like the barn cats, which other people seem to have in place and working well. We didn't actually do that. We tried it once. It was really successful. We sent something to some stables. They loved it and then the cat ended up moving into the house. So we put the story up on Facebook and they copped a barraging from, you know, Facebook friends. And so, th because the organisation had such a bad reputation before, I think they just got really scared and they just stopped doing it. So, that was an area that we didn't do well and we could have a lot of opportunity to help cats, but we didn't do it that... We needed to work on that. And then there were some people that were worried that we would run out of cats for adoption. Like, Australia's going to run out of cats. <laughs> that would be a nice day. <laughs> so, we had that. So, what worked? Briefly, what worked? And we, we did lots of little things, and you will be doing some of these things or all of these things, and you're probably doing even things that we weren't doing. But what worked for us, and they, they didn't, you know, one thing didn't work the best, that everything contributed. So if you put all the little bits that you do all in the big pie, you know, like you just, the bucket just fills up. So, and so what worked was these were the initiatives that we implemented. Oh, five more minutes, wow. Um, I forgot what I was going to say. <laughs> I was excited with five minutes. Um, we, we started a Seniors for Seniors program. One of the, the um, shelter team leaders there, she absolutely loves that and she's fantastic at it. And so she would take a really placid, usually an older cat, out to the senior um, nursing homes around the place and she just let them pat it for an hour or so. And they absolutely loved it. And then she got, somebody put it in the local paper and then it went somewhere else and then somebody else got hold of it and now she's got this long list of nursing homes that want to actually, for her to come out and interact with the people. We um, started to try and rehome FIV cats. They actually didn't help my length of stay because, you know, they hang around a bit, but that's okay, I could cope with that. Foster to adopt, trial adoptions. Uh, we do those for the tricky ones. We ramped up the foster care program and the foster care coordinator actually loves the neonatal stuff and she loves the Kitten Coalition. Rosemary, where have you gone? Um, she, she really likes that sort of thing and she's done a, a lot of amazing things for us for that. The last litter fund, I'm sure a lot of you are doing that. But, you know, one person gets one cat and they get the little tabby cat, the mum. They don't get a D-sex and then, all, funnily enough, we've got five cats now. So now all of a sudden one cat's okay, five are too many. So they want to give me the lot. And I, so I'll take the kittens and we'll take those and we can sort of move those through the adoption process. But I don't want the four-year-old timid tabby that she's got that's okay in her house but come into our, you know, circus and she's, all she's going to do is just cower at the back of the cage and stay there forever. So, no, I'm not going to do that. You pay for the microchip, which was $40, and I'll desex her for free. And you come and take her. And everybody was happy to do that. So, I kept, we kept all those little timid, you know, cats. How many of you have gone in there and you think, what is it, black and white month this week? You know, Collingwood must be the grand final. All black and white cats. And then you've got all tabby cats. It's just like you get these runs of cats. And I didn't need another one of them. So... That, helped, that actually helped me a lot. The little fast trackers, we know about that. The snip and chip program, like I said before, 
was what worked really well. Council partnerships. When we started up the clinic, I got given a budget, and I think my boss just wanted to make sure that I knew what I was talking about, and we doubled it, so that shut him up. Oh, that's just been recorded, hasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Um, <laughs> and moving on, so what was the most effective thing that we did? Can you edit that bit out, whoever's doing that? <laughs> the most effective things that we did, the top three, know your numbers, right? The magic number. You need to know what you can deal with. Now, bigger organisations have more capacity. Smaller organisations have perhaps reduced capacity. But you need to be aware of what you can do so that your place is that five-star resort for your guests. Snip and Chip program helped us a lot. Council partnerships, I can't stress enough how valuable they are. So if you've not got any, start some. And if there's any council people here and you're looking for someone that you want to go and play with, look, come and talk to me. I mean, I'll come, you know, desex your cats, that's okay. We can do that, Liz, can't we? <laughs> so they were the three things that worked. And look, I had this table up the other day, but if you just look at the impact of spaying cats, I mean, it's always the girls that cause the trouble, like we all know that. Um, and so just in the past two-year period, I just worked out how many spays that I'd done, just private spays, not shelter stuff. These are just the surgeries from just the private clients that we were getting in through our clinic. And we did 3,000 spays. And I just worked out, I just sort of did a poetic licence, each cat will have an average of four kittens. So we just prevented, just by spaying, you know, 3,000 cats over two years, not all at once, 6,500 kittens were not born. And even if only 1,000 of those kittens are coming into your shelter at some point in their life, you know, there's, who's going to be upset if they don't get more strays, abandoned cats, ferals, injured things? Who's going to complain about that? So that was the value of, you know, just implementing these things. This is what actually helped us to get everything under control. And as from what the council came back with, in six years, we reduced our stray impounded intake by over 80%. And that, that, was, all, that was all that I did, just desex cats. You can't adopt your way out of the cat overpopulation problem, you have to de-sex. And the numbers speak for themselves. That data thing, which I thought was reasonably boring, all of a sudden became very exciting. So anyway, that, I hope that helps you if it gives you some ideas, but that was what worked for us. <laughs>